you can't stop bluffing them, you can't continue bluffing the market that there's no impairment. They move to this fair value through OCI, guess what? No income statement effect of the impairment ever. So this is the reason we have many, many banks have been considering and asking us that they want to early adopt IFRS 9 because they want to, in some cases, reverse the impairment losses on the available for sale portfolios. And in some cases, they, they forgot to book. I mean, the decline is already at 80 or 90 percent above the, below their cost, and they still thought it wasn't significant. So they needed to book it at some point in time. Early application is permitted. Yes, people have used it and abused it. I don't know if they applied their mind to hell to collect at all. I don't think they have. <laughs> they just said, oh, here's an out, and they've done it. It's a retrospective standard. Can I take questions at the question point? I'm sorry about that. It's a retrospective standard, which means if you're moving from one category to another, you go back in time as if it was always that category. So if something moved from fair value to amortized cost, you account for it as if it was amortized cost forever. You adjust your prior period earnings. That's why it helps these people with available for sale, <laughs> because they may have booked impairment losses. They get to reverse that impairment losses and park it in equity. Now, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a table. I don't know if you can read it properly, so I'm going to read the this, this slide to you. If you decided to apply IFRS 9 before 1st January 2011, the date of initial application could be any date. Now, what this means, on the date of initial application is when you choose to apply IFRS 9. What do you do? You take all your financial assets that are not yet derecognized, that you haven't sold, and you put them to this amortized cost test. Before 1st of January 2011, you could have chosen any date. We had clients choosing 30th December. We had clients choosing 24th of December. We had clients choosing 13th of June. Why they've done this date? You know what? The standard allowed you. We couldn't stop them. And there were very, very deliberate reasons for doing it. They just sold that bad investment, could, got it out of the books. Let's move on to IFRS 9. That's the reason. But after 1st January 2011, your date of initial application has to be the first day of the year. So before, you had a choice. You could cherry pick any day of the year to be your date of initial application. Then if you adopt uh, IFRS 9 before 1st January 2012, you have a choice not to restate comparatives. But by choosing not to restate comparatives doesn't mean you can not account for retrospectively. It's your first year's opening retained earnings that is fixed. If you adopt IFRS 9 after 1st January, you have to restate your comparatives. Okay. Question and answers. Amir, I'll take your question. Do you want to wait for the mic? <laughs> no, I think let's wait for the mic for the benefit of everyone. It's coming. You just mentioned that the okay. applicability, uh, effectiveness of the date will be delayed to 2015 and uh, people are allowed to early adopt this IFRS and there will be almost a four year gap between the fact that you are allowed to early adopt and then when the uh, standard becomes finally right. applicable. Correct. Isn't it a m massive issue? Yeah, it is. And, and obviously when IFRS 9 is being allowed to be uh, applied um, earlier, uh, when there are number of related um, issues which have not been sorted out like impairment and also hedging also right so so there are parts of is 39 would it would yeah. still be applicable right relating right. to impairment agreed but the reality is i, I get the point and maybe i can uh, i'm going to paraphrase that that question is it worthwhile to early adopt ifrs 9 if it's work in progress and because there's such a wide gap is it worthwhile to early adopt you know what, the standards allow you to early adopt, so if a client comes there and says they want to early adopt, there's nothing under IFRS that prevents me. You know, as a, some regulators, I mean Kuwait regulator told people not to early adopt. But that's interfering with IFRS. In the UAE we discussed whether we're going to stop people. We said if people want to early adopt, we're going to have to allow them because the standards allow them. In Jordan and Lebanon, the regulator has insisted that they early adopt IFRS 9 because they wanted them to avoid the problem of this AFS portfolio for the banks. So very, very interesting. But the reality is it's allowed. 
you are dealing with a, a piecemeal kind of thing. If you adopt the early version of IFRS 9, you don't have to early adopt the other versions that come through. You can wait till 2015. You understand it. However, if you want to adopt step 2, you need to have adopted step 1. <laughs> That's the only rule. But you can adopt step 1 and don't ad adopt step 2, 3, 4, 5. But if you want to adopt step 3, you needed to have do done 2 and 1. Very, very complicated. You know what, if you think early adoption is an issue, I mean when we talk about IFRS 10, if somebody decides to early adopt IFRS 10 and the other person doesn't, you may potentially have two people consolidate. That's a reality. All right. Anyway, that's the reality. Now, what we've spoken, so let's take the question. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned earlier that the current standard does not address impairment. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I remember reading the original exposure draft. It did talk about the expected loss model for impairment. Yes, so yes. didn't that exactly make it through to the final standard? Right. If you right. can briefly talk about that. Thank you for Thank bringing you. that question up. You see, what we're saying is we don't have the full picture of IFRS 9. The impairment of financial assets isn't done yet. We're still focusing on IS 39. IS 39 has an incurred loss model. What is an incurred loss model for the benefit of everyone here? Something must have happened before you book a loss. They want to move to an expected loss model. Now what's an expected loss model? is you anticipate a loss from outset. But it's, for me, it's counterintuitive. <laughs> I give you a loan of 100. Immediately, I provide you 5. <laughs> Why did I give you the loan? <laughs> you understand? But that's the expected loss model. They want you to build the provision on that. Because the criticism with current IS-39 was that it delayed the recognition of losses. It waited for Lehman to collapse. Then people booked losses. It didn't intrinsically provision or create that buffer. So they want to move back to expected loss, but practically we've been challenging it. Our clients hate it. The way it seems, it's going a lot too into Basel III. But I'm not going to cover it now, because I want it to crystallize, and then we'll talk about it again. All right. So thank you for that question. Any further questions there? Yep. Exactly. Uh, it, it seems that if it is an equity instrument, do that. It is a debt instrument, and if whether it's, it's several tests like HTC, as, as you mentioned, HTCM, but in, in previously we had this option. I mean, there, there could be a bank or a company which might be buying a, a sh uh, some some bonds, maybe f the same bond, either for for, for, for different nature, I mean, maybe for for keeping for for coming the the, the repayments of the principal and the interest and maybe the same for 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 fair value so right. earlier uh, the, the is 39 uh, actually uh, was uh, right. addressing that fact and you you could mark that either for, for each category I, i'm not sure whether this the same uh, exactly how this this problem now i get you if i'm going to paraphrase your question i'm going to paraphrase your question you're saying you know what on the good old is 39 we had these options anyway what's the use of ifrs 9 the reality is the way IFRS 9 is approaching it, it's not on an arbitrary definition. The starting point is looking at business model and it's looking at characteristic. Now what could have happened, I could have had a very, very exotic bond that sits in Iceland that I'm holding to maturity, which would have qualified as held to maturity. Whereas under this standard, because it's exotic and it's got funny things in it, I can't get it into SPPI. So what's, what's it doing? It's not focusing. You see what people used to do was abuse definitions. Now he's saying, wait a minute, let's look at your business. Can I verify what's in your business? Yes, I know your business. You're a retail bank. Can I look at the contract? Yes. It's taking it, some people say it's bringing more judgment. I'm saying it's taking away a lot of that subjectivity that people used to have. Where it's bringing in subjectivity is we need to determine business model. But business model is something that's visible, rather than intention. You understand? So it, it, it is a change. It's a change in mindset. Yes, we may get to the same answer. <laughs> For the simple guy who's not a bank, he's going to get the same answer. I don't think there's any difference. His life is the same. But the reality is it's the way you approach the question that's different. 
You don't start off with, let's see 